bring her back to me. Without the energy to head to the bedroom, I slept quietly on the living room sofa that day. A few days later, my son-in-law Kenny visited my house before going to work. It will all be over soon. After leaving only those words, Kenny headed to work. His unusually strong tone left me feeling uneasy, but I didn't dwell on it too deeply. Later that evening, my husband Russ returned home without a word and went straight to the bathroom. As I watched his back, I realized I no longer felt anything. Despite our relationship having grown so cold, the layout of our home meant we had no choice but to sleep in the same room. I quietly entered the bedroom once Russ had fallen asleep. However, even with my eyes closed, I couldn't seem to drift off. I tossed and turned, unable to find rest, until the clock struck 1 a.m. in the silent night. At that moment, I felt someone's presence in the room. Heart pounding, I opened my eyes to find Kenny there. Why? Ignoring my question, Kenny forcefully pulled me out of bed and shoved me into the closet. He followed, closing the door just enough to obscure the room. What's going on all of a sudden? Sure. Kenny raised one hand, and the pressure of his control made me shut up involuntarily. He continued to observe the room through the narrow gap in the door. Just wait a little longer. I didn't know what he was waiting for, but I remained still. A few minutes later, it happened. What? As I watched the eerie scene unfolding in the bedroom, my breath caught, and I could do nothing but observe. People prefer happy endings over bad endings. An ending where everyone is happy, laughing together without anyone missing. But does such a story of universal happiness truly exist? Isn't someone's happiness inevitably tied to someone else's misfortune? This is my story of a happy ending. Happy birthday, mom. I am Lisa Moore. I'll be turning 57 this year. Usually, at this age, people don't bother remembering their exact age, but my daughter Kathy celebrates it so thoughtfully every year that I remember. This year, she gave me a beautiful fountain pen to use at work, considering my job as a full-time employee. I wonder if it was a wallet last year? I have this for you. Happy birthday. Kathy, who grew up as such a kind-hearted daughter, has her husband. Kenny, Kathy's former colleague, is a quiet and often absent-minded young man. When he was first introduced as Kathy's boyfriend, I'll admit I felt a bit anxious. However, his gaze toward Kathy is filled with kindness, and I gradually realized that he's someone who can empathize with others. It put my mind at ease. Even now, Though his words may be a bit vague, the gift he handed over was meticulously wrapped, containing a beautiful scarf inside. He's polite and incredibly gentle. I feel fortunate to be surrounded by such wonderful individuals. Thank you both. I'll cherish it. Thank you too. Oh, and I bought a cake, so let's eat it now. I'll cut it. Thanks. Here, Mom, have a seat here. The cake presented was neatly divided into four pieces. Yes, we're not just a family of three. As Kenny carefully served each slice onto plates, the living room door opened. You're making too much noise, guys. Dad. Welcome back. It's mom's birthday today. Ah, uh, right. Is there a piece for me too? Ah. Uh, yes, please. When Russ received the cake from Kenny, he walked straight to the bedroom without even acknowledging me or Kathy. What's that? 
Not a single word of congratulations for mom. Well, well, there's nothing we can do. It's been like this for years, and I don't mind anymore. Russ used to be a very kind person. We promised to be good parents together and had Kathy. At first, I thought Russ was trying to be a good parent too. When Kathy started crying, he would rush to her before me, and he'd bring toys home almost every day. However, parenting, for better or worse, consumes time. Russ gradually began prioritizing his desires over spending time with Kathy. As a result, young Kathy grew distant from Russ. Perhaps unhappy with this, Russ started avoiding time with Kathy even more, eventually coming home only to sleep. No matter how unwell Kathy or I felt, Russ remained indifferent, and it seemed our emotional distance widened further. By the time Kathy was in elementary school, our household income was decreasing, and I worked diligently to make ends meet and provide for Kathy. However, Russ's recent behavior and abnormal decline in finances have raised suspicions. His late returns every day, significantly reduced savings, and the unfamiliar scent of cologne, all point to infidelity or perhaps excessive drinking. Well, either way, it doesn't matter. Regardless, he has long exceeded the limits of forgiveness. However, he cleverly concealed it so that no conclusive evidence could be obtained, and the months passed in a state of ambiguity. I'm sorry, Mom. It's okay, you don't need to apologize. I see. If anything happens, let me know right away. Well, we're going home now. Thank you for having us. Take care. I sighed quietly as I saw the two of them off to the entrance. Kathy and I are currently living separately on the same property. After Kenny, who had no family, decided to come live with us, and considering Russ's situation, we decided to build another house on our property. Even so, we eat dinner together here at night, so I am sure I spend more time with them than Russ. If we're together this much, maybe we didn't really need to build another house. That's what I thought. For me, the two of them were family, and we intended to continue managing somehow as a trio. However, that life wouldn't last forever. One evening, after work ended unusually early, I was driving home when I received a call from Kenny. Lisa. Kathy was in an accident. What? She was hit by a truck. I was at work, but the hospital called. I'm heading there right away. Goodbye. Wait a minute. Despite his usually absent-minded demeanor, he spoke with an urgency I couldn't believe, then promptly hung up. What happened to Kathy? Why? Is she okay? In a state of semi-panic, I quickly changed direction and headed toward the hospital. I need to contact Russ. Even though we're not particularly close, surely he'd rush over in an emergency involving our daughter. That's what I thought. The cold, mechanical ringtone echoed in the car, but it persisted, refusing to fade away. No matter how many times I redialed, there was no answer. It was as if our situation didn't matter to him at all. I also tried calling Russ's workplace, but they informed me he had already left for the day. How could he not answer even after leaving work? What was he doing while our daughter faced this crisis? My anger toward Russ dissipated, though, when I saw Kathy's transformed appearance at the hospital. Kathy. Is this really Kathy? The room the hospital staff led me to wasn't a waiting room or a treatment room. It was a chilly space with several white cloths draped over something. One of those clothes had been lifted, and Kenny stood nearby. What lay beneath was undoubtedly human 
reddish-black cross-sections on the skin, black hair. But it was no longer in the shape of a person. The gruesome sight made me dizzy. Kenny supported me as I nearly collapsed. It seems that Kathy saved a child who was about to be hit. Truly, it's so Kathy-like, or something like that. The hand supporting me was terribly cold, and the voice was a painful mix of bitter laughter. That something, with half of its face still beautiful, forced me to acknowledge that this was indeed Kathy. But if I shifted my gaze just a little, what should have been there was no longer. As the police officer calmly explained the situation, tears welled up in my eyes. Hey, why Kathy? Kathy hasn't done anything wrong. Why take Kathy away from me? My emotions were in turmoil, and I was so distraught that I didn't even know what I was saying. But it was the only thing I could do. The sensation that if I didn't release all the overflowing tears and emotions, I would cease to be myself overwhelmed me. Kenny, despite the pained expression on his face, gently embraced my trembling shoulders. He, too, occasionally sniffled. What should I do from now on? Everything had become inconsequential. The events that followed ended astonishingly quickly. The police investigation revealed no foul play, just an accident. Kathy was celebrated as a hero for saving the child. The funeral was a tough occasion due to the enormous number of attendees. As a mother, I felt a twinge of pride knowing how many people admired Kathy. Kenny seemed similarly proud, wearing a slightly triumphant expression. However, during the funeral, there was no contact from Russ. Russ learned the truth only after everything had ended. I tried to contact you multiple times, I said to him. He entered silently through the front door, and I addressed him. Since I rarely initiated conversations with him, Russ seemed slightly surprised as he turned toward me. The vivid red lipstick smudges around his mouth were off-putting. Yeah, what did you want? What were you doing? Work. Don't answer a question with another question. So, what did you want? After that, I tried calling his workplace again, but they said he was taking a few days off. Work? Don't make me laugh. But I no longer had the energy to say such things. Kathy was in a traffic accident, and we finished the funeral yesterday. I see, that's unfortunate. I felt like I'd been punched in the head. Where in the world would a father find a father who would let his daughter's accident be someone else's problem? No pretense of sadness, no pretense of pain. Why not more upset? Um, yes, that's very unfortunate. So, what were you doing during our daughter's emergency? So it was work, I'm sorry about Kathy, but I was working, so what could I do? Don't make me keep saying it. Russ said irritably, disappearing into the bedroom. The hand resting on my knee tightened involuntarily. Frustration. Russ, who seemed indifferent even after our daughter was gone, and my own inability to respond to him, both infuriated me. How did we end up like this? When did we go wrong? Bring Kathy back. Today, lacking the energy to head to the bedroom, I fell asleep quietly on the living room sofa, my unpleasant feelings churning within me. Since then, the days when Russ comes home have clearly decreased. Today, Kenny and I were the only ones who said grace before the empty dining table. There were no smiles. The air was heavy, filled only with a lingering sense of loneliness. After that, I became unable to focus on anything, and I'm currently on an extended leave from work. I didn't do anything at home, 
but just stared at the picture of Kathy by my side. Seeing me like this, Kenny had started helping with household chores. He often expressed concern and tried to talk to me, but I could only give vague responses. I felt a bit sorry for him, but I didn't want to think about anything. Kenny occasionally muttered something as if talking to someone, but even that didn't matter much. On that particular day, Kenny visited my house before heading to work. Although he usually comes in the evening due to busy mornings, I wondered what had changed. What's going on? It'll all be over soon. Before I could inquire further, he left for work. His unusually firm tone left me feeling uneasy. I didn't dwell on it much, assuming it was work-related, and spent another empty day. That evening, Russ returned home after a long absence. Without a word, he headed straight to the bathroom. I felt nothing anymore. Despite the layout constraints, we had no choice but to share the same room for sleep. I quietly entered the bedroom around the time Russ fell asleep, but even with my eyes closed, I struggled to doze off. Tossing and turning, I remained awake until the clock struck 1 a.m. At that moment, I sensed someone's presence in the room. Curious, I opened my eyes slightly, and there stood Kenny. Why are you here? Ignoring my question, Kenny yanked me out of bed and forcibly shoved me into the closet. He followed suit, squeezing in until the door barely closed, revealing a glimpse of the room. The closet, now housing both of us, felt stuffy and cramped. Wait, what's going on all of a sudden? Sure. Kenny raised one hand, momentarily silenced by the pressure. He continued to peer through the gap in the door, observing the room quietly. Just a little more patience. Although I didn't know what we were waiting for, I found myself doing the same. Gradually, the room became shrouded in mist, as if it were enveloped in white fog. Even the closet, which had been oppressively hot just moments ago, now felt like freezing air. The mist coalesced into a shape near Russ's pillow, eventually transforming into the figure of a woman. What? The figure seemed eerily familiar. It was Kathy. Although her form lacked clarity, I knew it was her. The mist, undeniably Kathy, had enveloped the room. Kenny, sensing my impending outcry, covered my mouth with his hand. Kathy stood near Russ, murmuring something. In response, Russ's fitful sleep intensified. It appeared as though a ritual was unfolding, one designed to torment him. Even I felt suffocated, beads of cold sweat forming on my skin. The scene persisted until Kathy abruptly ceased her movements, dissipating into thin air. The suddenness left me bewildered. Russ, though no longer thrashing, bore an abnormal sheen of sweat on his forehead. The vision I'd witnessed was no illusion. Seeking answers, I turned to Kenny. His response was cryptic, not here. Let's head to the living room. Hey, was that Kathy, right? Yes, it was Kathy. More precisely, it's like Kathy's lingering presence. Lingering presence. Exactly. When someone leaves something unfinished in reality, it remains like that. Why do you know about this? I've been able to see things like that since I was a child. Kenny had strong intuition from a young age, seeing things that others couldn't. It was a normal part of his daily life. However, it also meant he often felt drained during the day, which might explain his occasional aloofness. Kathy knew about this aspect of Kenny and was actually drawn to him because of it. She found it intriguing. 
Because of this ability, I have always avoided people because I thought they would make me feel uncomfortable. But Kathy accepted me like that. Kenny gazed into the void again, a nostalgic expression on his face. There was nothing visible there, but perhaps Kathy was present, just beyond my perception. I wasn't one to believe in spirits, but after witnessing that scene earlier, I couldn't dismiss it entirely. When Kathy was gone, I couldn't sleep at all that night. But at that moment, I felt like Kathy was there. It wasn't clear then, but... Yeah, I see. As time passed, I could see her more distinctly. Now we can even converse. Kenny occasionally talks to someone, it turns out to be Kathy, lingering here as a thought. Not just observing, but having conversations. To think he can speak again with someone he thought he'd lost forever. No matter how hard I squint, I can't see Kathy's form. Kenny's ability is truly enviable. Kathy said something. At first, she apologized. Said sorry for suddenly disappearing. I want to tell Kathy that she doesn't need to apologize. She hasn't done anything wrong. She's a hero for protecting the child. She was really worried about you. She wanted you to recover quickly. There's no way to recover. Kathy was my only family, my reason for living. And she was very angry with her dad. So today, she said she wanted to vent that anger, and that was why she did that way. Sorry for surprising you. I see. But why did you put me in the closet? Honestly, I don't understand things like spirits or lingering emotions. I thought Kathy's negative feelings might affect you, so I did it. Ah, I see. It did feel a bit suffocating. And Russ suddenly coming back today, could Kathy be involved? Yes. Kathy seemed to have done something. I don't know the details. Kenny shrugged, acknowledging the mysterious nature of spirits. I had plenty of thoughts about Russ too, and I'd been waiting for a chance to confront him. Maybe now was the perfect opportunity to resolve things for our crumbling family. Kenny. Do you have time tomorrow? Ha. Huh. Oh, yes, I think so. Let's put an end to this. I want to have a proper conversation with Russ. Maybe Kathy can join too. She's nodding, with a big smile. Do you have something in mind? Not sure, but... Heh, you're a reassuring ally. Well then, let's call it a night. Sure. Oh, um, Kathy really cared about you. So, please don't push yourself too hard. I understand. Good night, then. Kenny, and probably Kathy, headed home together. I didn't want to return to the bedroom, so I stretched out on the living room sofa. Unlike earlier, sleep quickly overcame me, and it was the best rest I'd had in a while, even though the sofa wasn't exactly comfortable. I woke up to the sound of birds chirping. Sunlight streamed through the gap in the curtains, creating a pleasant morning atmosphere. As I sat there, lost in thought, suddenly I heard shouting from the bedroom, followed by heavy footsteps running toward me. Lisa. I've been wrong. I've been cheating all this time. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Russ burst into the living room and immediately started apologizing. Although I was taken aback by the sudden confession, I couldn't help but imagine that Kathy had said something to him. Why would you do such a thing? Since Kathy was born, you've always been focused on her. At first, it was just a way to get back at you, 
but somehow. Hmm. I'm reflecting on it now. I won't do something like this again. Kathy made me realize. Let's start over as a couple from here. Russ's voice trembled as if he were about to cry. It was rather unbecoming for an adult to cry and wail like this, especially when it was his own fault. It's too late. Do you think I'd forgive a man who cheated during Kathy's final moments? In response to Russ's pleading, my voice came out much colder than I had anticipated. Russ was surprised by my harshness and shook his shoulders. But, listen. It's because you've always been so focused on Kathy that you hardly notice me. The real problem is you, not me, right? As Russ raised his voice in frustration, my body tensed up slightly. However, at that moment, the front door opened, and Kenny walked in. Russ looked at him, or more precisely, at the empty space to Kenny's left and began trembling. Ah, oh, so you can see her. Kathy, it's not what you think. It's not that I didn't care about you. I was just lonely. I even wanted to attend your funeral. Russ desperately tried to explain, but he was staring into empty space. Yet, I'm sure Kathy was there. Kathy is furious right now. For her mom's sake. I still couldn't see anything, but Russ's panic told the story of reality. However, I felt that such shallow words wouldn't resonate. I cheated on Lisa because she never looked at me in the first place. It was you who took Lisa away from me in the first place. Why should I listen to you? It wasn't appropriate for a father to say that his wife was taken by his daughter. We had promised to raise her together, after all. Yet Russ shifted responsibility onto others, refusing to understand the wrong he had done. Hey, Lisa. Say you forgive me quickly. Otherwise, who knows what Kathy will do to me. Hurry up. Please. Even at this point, he only cared about self-preservation. It truly left me exasperated. Even Kenny next door wore a disapproving expression. Lisa. I'm your husband, you know. Kathy is your father. Let's talk it out once, and then you'll understand. Right? Oh, I was utterly fed up. Why had I been in a relationship with this man for so long? I should have realized the absurdity of his thinking much earlier. But today, I can finally say goodbye to this ambiguous daily life. Even during this period, he was only concerned about self-preservation. Honestly, I was at a loss. Even Kenny looked exasperated. Lisa. I'm your husband, you know. Kathy, I'm your father. Let's talk once, and then you'll understand. Right? Ah, uh, I'm fed up. Why did I keep this relationship with such a man for so long? I should have realized this absurd idea much earlier. But today, I can finally say goodbye to this ambiguous everyday life. From now on, I no longer consider you my husband or Kathy's father disappear from my sight. As I emphatically declared those words, Russ widened his eyes and slumped. His lifeless gaze fixed on the floor, and he mumbled something incomprehensible. I approached him, bewildered by the sudden turn of events, but Kenny stopped me, assuring me it would be okay. Suddenly, I felt as though someone was embracing me from behind. There stood Russ, devoid of any will, but I sensed it was Kathy. Even though I couldn't see, touch, or hear her, I knew I was being held. Warmth enveloped me, and I whispered, 
Thank you, as I hugged back. From somewhere, I heard a faint apology. No need to apologize. Of course, it's incredibly lonely, but... I'm glad I can feel you like this one last time. Thank you so much for everything until now. Be happy. Kathy's presence and warmth vanished instantly. Overwhelmed by sudden loneliness, I reached out desperately, but my hand met nothing. I guess I can't compete with you after all. Kathy had the happiest expression I've ever seen. As a mother, I'm sure there were things I could have done better for her. But hearing Kenny's words reassured me. If she's content, that's enough. I'll take my regrets to my grave. Uh. Uh. Russ hung his head, frozen in place. Later, I took him to a psychiatric clinic. Occasionally, he regains sanity only to tremble in fear and mutter something incomprehensible. The doctor was puzzled by these uncommon symptoms, but ultimately, he decided to admit him to the psychiatric hospital. Even when I looked at Russ, now an empty shell, no sympathy welled up within me. After all, this was the binding love Kathy left behind, disguised as a parent-child bond. Now that everything is settled, perhaps I should return to work. Maybe this isn't a neat resolution. Kathy is gone, and Russ is broken. To outsiders, it might seem like a bad ending. But my heart felt light. Years of torment caused by Russ had finally come to an end. I had the chance to embrace Kathy one last time. The gentle presence of Kenny who would continue supporting me as family, made it a splendid happy ending from my perspective. No more regrets. Russ and I are technically still married. Honestly, I have no intention of taking care of him going forward, but due to matters like disability benefits and property ownership, we haven't divorced. Still, I feel a slight twinge of guilt, so I occasionally check in on him. Unfortunately, I can't visit him at the psychiatric hospital where he resides. He continues to live in fear and occasionally mutters incomprehensible things. It will likely be quite some time before he's discharged. While I don't wish unhappiness upon him, I hope he truly faces the consequences of his actions. On the other hand, Kenny seemed a bit disappointed when Kathy's presence faded away. Even though I can't see Kathy anymore, it's good to see you brighter than before. He's adorable when he says things like that. We've discussed his future living arrangements before. Kenny, you don't need to worry about me anymore. You're free to live your life as you please. There's no need for you to stay in this house. What you're saying is true, but... If you're okay with it... I'd like to stay here. Why? Kathy always appreciated you. Despite the environment, you allowed her to pursue what she wanted, and she grew up straight thanks to you. Kathy wouldn't say that. No, I agree with her. You have incredible nurturing qualities. I feel like I'm living with my real mother in this house. Kenny blushed a little turning away, but his words made me smile. His reaction was so much like that of a real son. Even though he seemed a bit reluctant, we both ended up laughing. The sound of our laughter filled the room, and a refreshing breeze swept through. It felt as pleasant as Kathy's bright smile in the photo frame. How did you find this story? If you enjoyed it, consider subscribing to our channel. Until next time. It's disgusting for an old hag to get pregnant. If you take maternity leave, you're fired. The one who suddenly yelled at me with a vein throbbing on his forehead was the new branch manager who had just joined last month. Jason, 
who always looked down on the rehired veteran employees, became visibly annoyed when I informed him that I was taking maternity leave. A veteran employee who happened to be nearby overheard our exchange and trembled in fear. Branch manager, your life is over. My condolences. Jason looked puzzled, not understanding the implication. But it wasn't surprising. He didn't know anything about my standing in this company. My name is Kathy. I work as a pharmacist at a pharmacy attached to a major supermarket. My husband and I had been too busy with our work to have children, but at 42, I found out I was pregnant. We were overjoyed to finally have a child. Although it was a late pregnancy, I was determined to give birth even if it meant risking my life. Around that time, the previous branch manager transferred to another store, and Jason, the new branch manager, arrived. Jason had been a branch manager at another pharmacy before his career change. Although he was competent in his work, his human decency seemed to have been left behind in his mother's womb. He regularly mocked me for being pregnant at an older age and belittled the veteran employees who were rehired. No one would believe that an old hag like you is pregnant with that big belly. They just think you're fat. Excuse me? Did you just call me an old hag? Well, you're over 40, right? So yeah, old hag is about right. I was more shocked than angry at his nonchalant, unashamed remarks. He also looked down on the veteran employees, calling them pathetic old folks clinging to the pharmacy even after retirement, and didn't even try to hide his immature thoughts. Despite the company rehiring these highly capable individuals, Jason was indifferent, hating them solely for their age. He even went as far as to intentionally delete data they were working on or report non-existent mistakes to the headquarters. We've got quite a troublesome guy here, huh? Steve, a veteran pharmacist who was rehired at 65, sighed. Well, he's just joined, so let's give it a little more time. Everyone working at the pharmacy agreed and endured his behavior in silence. However, Jason's arrogant attitude showed no sign of improvement. He would be polite and courteous to customers and superiors but treated us pharmacists and colleagues condescendingly. One day, an elderly female customer looked worriedly at the shelves of medicine. May I help you? Jason always greeted customers with a smile and politeness, but he struggled with the actual assistance afterward. My grandchild has caught a cold, but do you have any cold medicine suitable for a three-year-old? He ended up passing the customer off to another staff member. Uh, please wait a moment. Is Steve around? Steve, with his extensive knowledge and amiable demeanor, was a beloved and relied upon pharmacist among us. However, to Jason, Steve was just an old man hanging around the pharmacy. Steve, attend to the customer. I don't know about the medicine. Yes, of course. I'll help her. Jason's behavior was always like this, condescending but ultimately useless, offloading his work onto us and making his poor attitude even more apparent. While qualifications are required for pharmacists, Positions like clerical or support roles, including branch managers, can be filled without qualifications. However, it's essential for someone in charge of a pharmacy to have at least some knowledge about the medicines. Jason, though, never lowered his head to us pharmacists, refusing to study or ask for guidance. How he managed to hold his position as branch manager was beyond us. Time passed and my due date approached. I had informed the previous branch manager about my maternity leave, and it was approved. However, Jason, knowing this from the handover, tried to ignore it and make me continue working. What? You're taking time off to slack? 
Work until the last minute. I can't do this anymore. It's a high-risk pregnancy as it is. That's not my problem. Besides, it's disgusting for an old hag to get pregnant. If you take maternity leave, you're fired. Jason's high-handed attitude was relentless. This was his usual demeanor in the staff room away from customers. Hey, branch manager. Steve, who was in the same room and overheard our conversation, widened his eyes as if he had seen something terrifying. Trembling, he directed his voice towards Jason. Branch manager, your life is over. My condolences. Huh? What do you mean, all of a sudden? Jason looked puzzled, but then he understood Steve's words when he saw where Steve was looking. President. Tony, the president overseeing our pharmacy group, happened to be visiting for an inspection at that moment. From his expression, it was clear he had overheard our entire exchange. Jason, what did you mean by your earlier statement? President, thank you for coming all the way here. I don't need your flattery. I asked what you meant. Ignoring Jason's groveling, Tony coldly questioned him. Actually, this woman, Kathy, said she wanted to take maternity leave, so I was strictly reprimanding her. Taking maternity leave is a rightful entitlement. Why did you need to reprimand her? Well, a late pregnancy at her age won't go well anyway. A 42-year-old pregnant woman? Who knows what kind of life she's been leading? Jason laughed unpleasantly, shrugging exaggeratedly. You're only 40 yourself, Jason. Not much of a difference. Shut up! You're just an old hag! Tony frowned at Jason's old hag comment. Although I felt a sense of triumph, Steve seemed very worried. I can't overlook what you just said. You called Kathy an old hag earlier, didn't you? No! That must be a mistake! No need to make excuses now. I already told Tony about your it's okay to call you an old hag if you're over 40, right? Jason, trying to cover up, was wide-eyed at my words. You called the president by his name. Wait, did the president just call you Kathy too? Yes, because Kathy is my wife. What? It was no wonder Jason was shocked. Only the veteran employees who had worked here for a long time knew about my marriage to Tony. I didn't flaunt it, and I worked under my maiden name, so it was unlikely anyone noticed. It's your fault for not making it clear. Jason, snapping, received a cold look from Tony. Kathy didn't want others to treat her differently because she's my wife. It was her considerate decision. Unlike someone who doesn't have any consideration at all, my effort seems to have backfired. I laughed, and Jason glared at me with frustration. Then, in the staff room, Tony and I started questioning Jason. Jason, you've been quite disrespectful to Kathy and the staff pharmacists, haven't you? Not at all. I was just being friendly and trying to keep things casual. Jason, flustered, struggled to find an excuse. You called me an old hag. Could you be quiet? Jason, losing his composure, banged his palm on the table. Tony watched him with a cold gaze. Jason, give it up. Kathy has told me everything. Steve has been with me since I founded this pharmacy, practically a comrade in arms. And you called him a pathetic old man clinging to the pharmacy, didn't you? Jason's face grew paler with each new revelation. As my husband said, Steve had walked alongside him for much longer than I had. 
Tony had founded the pharmacy with his pharmacist qualification, starting with just one store in a small town. It grew into a nationwide chain over time. I eventually joined one of those pharmacies and married Tony, with Steve celebrating our union. With such a history, Tony was undoubtedly furious about the insults to his comrade and his wife. He kept his anger in check, speaking calmly but sternly to Jason, who continued to make excuses. It's just Kathy's word. You can't trust the other employees. They're all in cahoots. President, I'm innocent. Seeing Jason shouting and spitting, I sighed deeply before my husband did. You're really hopeless, aren't you? What do you mean? Do you think the president would believe me without proof? I presented solid evidence. I nodded at Tony and took a voice recorder from my bag. Jason's face turned even paler. That, that can't be. Yes, that's exactly it. I recorded every word you said. When I pressed play, his abusive comments played back clearly. Stop! Please stop it! Jason, covering his face with his hands, looked horrified. I'm disappointed because I thought you were excellent as a manager. This pharmacy serves elderly customers as well. I don't think someone with a bias against veteran employees is suitable to be a branch manager. We've been lenient because we thought you were new here, but it seems you won't change. We can't continue to tolerate this burden any longer. A burden? Are you saying I'm a burden? That's right. You don't know anything about the medications, you have no desire to learn, and you look down on your employees. We don't need a branch manager like that in our pharmacy. As soon as I said that, Jason suddenly kneeled down in front of me, prostrating himself. Please, wait. I will put in the effort from now on. Let me learn here. I apologize for my previous rudeness. I didn't know your true identity. Jason cried miserably, begging for forgiveness, but my heart remained unmoved. If your attitude would have been different had you known my identity, that speaks volumes about you as a person. Jason, utterly defeated by my words, stayed kneeling on the floor with his head bowed. In the end, Jason was immediately dismissed. After being fired from our pharmacy, word of Jason's behavior spread throughout the industry, making it difficult for him to find employment. Unable to secure a position at another pharmacy, he now survives by working day and night in temporary jobs. This must be a humiliating blow to his pride. As for me, I took maternity leave and, despite the challenges of a late-in-life pregnancy, successfully gave birth to a healthy baby girl. Now, I am happily spending my days with my husband, watching our daughter grow. How did you enjoy this story? Please subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you in the next video.